99.9% of what I've done on the air has been on network television. And when you do games on network TV, you're not supposed to be leaning toward one team or the other. Although fans of both teams are always 100% convinced that you are rooting against their team. <laughs> including fans of the New York Yankees, who are, let's face it, the most privileged of all teams. And, and yet their fans are convinced that John Smoltz and I are rooting for the Twins. And Twins fans are convinced that we're kissing up to the Yankees. Ron Darling can probably attest to this. NBA Finals, Super Bowl, World Series, back when people wrote letters rather than going on Twitter or sending emails, you'd get a stack of mail would arrive at NBC after a World Series. And the letters could be exactly the same except for the postmark. You hate the Cleveland Indians. You love the Florida Marlins. You were so happy when the Marlins won, you could barely contain yourself, you SOB. And then would come the one postmark South Florida would say exactly the same thing in reverse. No network broadcaster has ever received a letter, an email, or a tweet that goes something like this. Dear Mr. Michaels, Nance, Buck, Musburger, Costas, I am a fan of the Seattle Mariners. Therefore, I had no particular rooting interest in the just concluded World Series between the Astros and the Nats. However, as a fair-minded person, I was appalled by your favoritism toward the Washington Nationals. No network broadcaster has ever received a communique along those lines. Because, believe it or not, the only thing the network broadcaster is rooting for is for a good game and for a good series. So, although I haven't spoken to him about it, I'm thinking that with the Nats up 2-0, when they went back to D.C., Joe Buck and John Smoltz are rooting for the Astros to get back in the series. And then when it's three games to two, since they'd already schlepped back to Houston, they're thinking it would be best if the Nats would win game six, then we get to game seven. And it would be best if game seven go to the ninth inning or maybe to extra innings. And beyond that rooting interest, here's the truth. They root for the cities where they have friends. We root for the cities that have the better hotels. <laughs> We root for our own damn convenience, pretty much is what we're rooting for. So, and, and you try to do a good down the middle job. But here's something else that fans never take account of. If the home team happens to be doing well, the announcer's voice has to rise to get up over the crowd. If the visitors hit a grand slam, you could call it like you're overlooking the 18th green at the Masters. You could practically whisper. It's not an indication of broadcaster bias. Also, if the Yankees are to play the Tampa Bay Rays, the Tampa Bay Rays don't have as much history as the New York Yankees. There's just less to reach into the notebook for. You try, you try to come up with everything. You try to be as fair and appreciative as possible, but the Yankees simply have more history. All of this leads me to what is probably not a revelation for many people in this room. I grew up a Yankee fan. I grew up a Yankee fan on Long Island. And like almost every kid who grew up in the late 1950s and through the 60s, my favorite player was this guy, Mickey Mantle. And yes, as it, tur as it turned out, I wound up being a close friend of Mickey's. I never called a game in which he played. When he retired, I was 16 years old. But his family did ask me to do the eulogy at his funeral. And I wound up doing the NBC Game of the Week with his teammate, Tony Kubek. And it was Tony who told the national audience that I'd been carrying this 1958 Mickey Mantle card around in my wallet since I was a little kid, which is true. It came in the first Topps bubblegum pack that I ever spent a nickel on. And, and there it was with that chalky piece of gum, which if you dropped it on the sidewalk would shatter like a pane of glass. And, and which if an anthropological dig takes place a thousand years from now, and some geologist digs up an old Norm Seaburn or Bob Perky, and that was the card that had the gum against it, that chalky film will still be on Bob Perky's face a thousand years from now. 
And what you did with those baseball cards in a more innocent time, you didn't save them. They had no monetary value. They only had sentimental value. And you cataloged them on a rainy day. Outfielders, pitchers, American League, National League, left-handed, right-handed, Yankees, whatever it might be. You flipped them. You traded them. You put them on the spokes of your bike to make a very cool sound as you pedaled around Hicksville and then Comac, where, where I grew up. That's what you did. But you wouldn't waste, you wouldn't waste a Mickey Mantle on the spoke of your bike. You wouldn't risk it by flipping it. That's what Jerry Lumpy's and Hector Lopez's were for. <laughs> not, you're not Mickey Mantle, not Willie Mays, not, not Hank Aaron. That's not, that's not wise. So I grew up on Long Island and when I was a kid, I was smart enough very early on to get the idea that if I was ever going to walk into Yankee Stadium without paying for a ticket, it was unlikely to be standing where Whitey Ford or Mickey Mantle stood, but more likely sitting where Mel Allen and Red Barber and the scooter Phil Rizzuto sat. And as a kid, wiffle ball, stick ball, whatever it might be, you're not only playing, at least if you were me, you heard the sound of the announcers. They were the soundtrack of your summer when it came to baseball. And when I was only 10 or 11 years old, I figured out that while I could listen to Lindsey Nelson on the Mets and Bob Murphy and Ralph Kiner and Howie, who grew up as a Met fan, could tell you Kiner's corner stories. One time, Ralph had Choo Choo Coleman, catcher, colorful catcher for the Mets on. And remember, they used to show up in their uniform right after the game, and they'd, they'd sit with Ralph. And Ralph sometimes talked himself down a blind alley and couldn't figure out how to get out. And the producer must have been saying, Ralph, Phil. And so he turns to Choo Choo and he's exhausted all of his questions about the game. And he says, so, Choo Choo, what's, what's your wife's name and what is she like? And Choo Choo said, her name is Mrs. Coleman and she likes me. <laughs> on, on another occasion, a late June day, Ralph's calling the game, Mets and the Phillies. He says, so, today is Father's Day. And to all you fathers out there, happy birthday. <laughs> These were the people who inspired me. <laughs> and I, I found out that while I could listen to the Yankees and Mets locally, if I took the keys to my dad's car and went out on the driveway on a summer night and turned the ignition key just far enough to light up the dashboard and the radio, and if I was careful enough, and if I calibrated that dial like a safe cracker, I could find, through the crackle and static, I could find the Orioles on WBAL in Baltimore, I could find uh, the Tigers on WJR in Detroit, I could get the, the Red Sox on a clear night. On a very clear night, I could hear Jack Buck and Harry Carey from KMOX in St. Louis, and all of that fed my dreams of being a broadcaster. But as, as a kid, my rooting interest was always with the Yankees. And that double header this past August on the Yes Network, when Michael Kay was sidelined, and I worked with David Cohn and uh, Paul O'Neill, gave me a chance to tell some of those Yankee stories. I, I did not think that I would uh, receive this award tonight, so I'm thinking of my New York baseball connections. And I apologize if some people have heard this story before. Uh, I told it on Ken Burns' baseball series. The first time I ever set foot in Yankee Stadium, I was seven years old. It was the end of the season, late September, final weekend of the year, one of the few years in that span that the Yankees did not win the pennant and go to the World Series. Uh, they were playing the Baltimore Orioles, and my dad took me to the game. The Yankees lost 7-2. to two. I was heartbroken that Mickey Mantle didn't play. Brooks Robinson hit a homer for the Orioles. Johnny Blanchard hit one for the Yankees. And back then, you could leave the ballpark by way of the field. They'd open up the gates leading out toward the elevated train, the bullpens in left field and in right field, and you could walk around the warning track, all the way around the ballpark, and then exit that way. And we got to the monuments in center field, which were on the field, because the center field wall was 461 feet from home plate. And there were only three monuments then, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Miller Huggins. And I'm seven years old. And I turn back from the monuments and I look toward home plate and I can't even see over the crest of the pitcher's mound. And then I turn back 
to the monuments, and I had what I think was a natural feeling for a seven-year-old kid who felt as if Yankee Stadium was St. Patrick's Cathedral. It was like a religious experience. What else would you think? I was convinced that the Sultan of Swat and the Iron Horse and their manager were buried right there underneath those monuments on the warning track. And I was just as convinced that when they left this mortal coil, Joe DiMaggio and Mickey Mantle would be buried next to them and it was too much for me and I began to cry. And my father tried to comfort me and convince me, well, yeah, they have passed away, but they're really not buried there. And I thought he was just, you know, trying to make me feel better because I wasn't, I wasn't buying it, that's for sure. In 1964, I attended my first World Series game. Yankees and Cardinals, game three of that World Series. Mantle won it with a homer in the bottom of the ninth off the Cardinal knuckleballer Barney Schultz. He passed Babe Ruth on the all-time World Series home run list. It was his record 16th home run. How much do you think a box seat for a World Series game at Yankee Stadium cost in 1964? How much? One at a time, please, ladies and gentlemen. 12, 12 bucks. 12 bucks. And uh, during the regular season, a box seat was three dollars and and 50 cents. So, by, by way of conclusion in this meandering monologue here, since I really had, had no notion that I was gonna be up here speaking about myself, the, the, other, the other New York memory or New York connection would be Syracuse University. I read in a Nick's yearbook when I was still in high school that Marty Glickman, the original voice of the Knicks, and Marv Albert had each gone to Syracuse. That was good enough for me. I went to Syracuse. They have one of the great communication programs in the country, and it spawned more sports broadcasters. It's, it's really a pretty illustrious list, more sports broadcasters than you could possibly list. I tried, I tried, unlike a guy like Joe Nathan or Ron Darling or others here or Mike Pagliarulo, I tried to make my high school baseball team in Comac. The coach was a math teacher named Chuck Orant. And Chuck Orant had pitched in the Pirates chain in the early 1950s, back when the minor leagues went all the way down to D-ball. And I think he got maybe as far as C-ball. And you know the way this works in high school. The social studies teacher, the math teacher, they throw him a, a little bit extra, and he coaches the basketball team or the baseball team. And Mr. Orant coached the baseball team. And he called me in toward the end of tryouts, and he said, you know, you're not a bad fielder, but I don't think you can hit your weight, and I don't think you weigh 120, <laughs> which might have been true at the time. He said, let me ask you something. Do you ever think about broadcasting? Because all you do is talk about baseball. <laughs> and I said, well, broadcasting is pretty much all I think about. He said, good, try that. <laughs> and, that's, and that's how he cut me. Now, while I was chewing up some time, did Jane Forbes Clark walk in? She did not. She, she did not. Okay. Well, as, as you, most of you know, Jane Forbes Clark and her family are kind of responsible for the ongoing glorious state of the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. Every Hall of Fame has its meaning, but of all the team sports we follow, Pretty clearly, the Baseball Hall of Fame has the greatest aura, the greatest luster, and what they've managed to do over the years, even as they've modernized it, even as they've looked in a forward way into the 21st century, they've maintained that special feeling for the history and tradition of a game where history and tradition mean more than in any other sport. Um, so, Jane. Jane's family goes, in terms of their connection to baseball, all the way back to 1936 when her grandfather, Stephen Clark, founded the museum. So she is a worthy inductee into the New York State Baseball Hall of Fame. So let's have a round of applause for Jane Forbes Clark. And Marty Appel, longtime PR guy and denizen of baseball, mostly associated with the Yankees, 
was supposed to be here tonight, and we're sorry that Marty was unable to make it, and he was going to induct Bobby Mercer and make the presentation to Kay Mercer. I'm happy to step in and do that in his stead. Uh, Bobby is part of my late childhood memories. I was in my teens by the time he arrived as a Yankee, and the connections to Mickey Mantle were unavoidable, both from Oklahoma, both started as shortstops, converted to outfielders, each signed by the legendary scout Tom Greenway, who had discovered Mickey and later discovered Bobby. Bobby had a, a brief stint with the Yankees in 65 and 66 before serving his country in the military, missing the entire seasons of 1967 and 68. So when he arrived full-time in 1969, it was the first season after Mickey had retired. So naturally, he became, for most of us, automatically our favorite Yankee. There was just something about it, even his last name started with an M, something about the way he carried himself. And I can still recall, speaking of those monuments, maybe you've seen this footage of Bobby playing center field. Someone hit a ball over his head and it rolled all the way to the 461 sign behind the monuments. And Bobby, instead of going around, kind of angled himself in between Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth and slipped in between the monuments. The way kids do when they're chasing a Spalding and a game of stickball and you go between cars to try and find it along the gutter. That was so cool. It was such like a sandlot thing. In 1970, the Yankees played, you don't see this anymore, a single admission Wednesday afternoon doubleheader in the middle of the summer against the Cleveland Indians. I went to the game along with three or four friends of mine from Comac High School. School was out, we had just graduated uh, our senior year in high school, and we're sitting in the lower right field stands behind the 344 sign at the old Yankee Stadium. In his last at bat in the first game of the doubleheader, Bobby homered of sudden Sam McDowell, the imposing left-hander for the Cleveland Indians. In the second game, with a walk mixed in, in his next three official at-bats, he homered on all three. So his fourth home run of the day, four consecutive home runs and four official at-bats, landed in the lower right field stands. I had a chance to catch it, but I missed it. It bounced and one of my classmates, after a mad scramble with a bunch of other people, one of my classmates came away with the ball. What he did with it, I have no idea. I'm sure Bobby would have liked to have had it. It was his best day in baseball, the fourth of four home runs in a doubleheader. Bobby, Bobby went on to great things with the Yankees. Hit 331 in 1971, became utterly beloved. One of my favorite stories about Bobby was everybody knew that Gaylord Perry threw a spitball. It was an open secret. And they're playing, maybe it was the Indians, one of Gaylord's many teams. And Bobby catches a fly ball for the last out in the top of an inning at Yankee Stadium. And now Gaylord's going to go back to the mound. So Bobby comes running in toward the dugout from center field and spits on the ball before rolling it <laughs> onto the pitcher's mound. Subsequently, he sent Gaylord a gift, a gallon of lard. And so the next time that the Yankees played the Indians, Gaylord greased up his entire hand, walked up to Bobby and said, hey, how you doing? <laughs> Shook hands and, and, left him, and left him with the grease. And then there was that still unforgettable day and night, 40 years ago in 1979, a day and night of tragedy and then a kind of triumph when Bobby delivered one of the eulogies for Thurman Munson, his close friend, George Steinbrenner flew the entire team to Ohio, then they got back on the plane and came back to New York for a nationally televised game against the Baltimore Orioles, a game they came from behind and won five to four, with all five runs being driven in by Bobby Mercer. Hit a homer off Dennis Martinez early in the game and had the game-winning walk-off hit at the bottom of the ninth off Tippy Martinez to win the game. It was one of the most emotional scenes in Yankee history. And, and an example of how sports, and maybe particularly baseball, at least at times, can be more than a game. Bobby Mercer was a great ball player, he was a great Yankee, he was a great teammate, 
and by the testimony of all who knew him, a great, great guy. He is more than deserving to be part of the New York State Baseball Hall of Fame and will make the presentation to Kay Mercer, okay?